Welcome to another Kundalini After Dark session. I'm your host, Brent Spirit, and I'm here on Zoom with 14 other people. We've got a few tuning in on YouTube. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight live. We're going to have a fun conversation today all about the benefits of Kundalini Awakening. So I've got some notes here I'll share about some of the benefits that I found throughout the process, and then I'm going to open the floor for others to share as well. If you want to share about your benefits, but of course, we can take the conversation in any direction related to the spiritual awakening path. We can also talk about some of the downsides and difficulties. You know, maybe you've got some questions for the group. Maybe you've got some responses. All is welcome. All is welcome. So together, we'll support one another and uh, normalize this process a little bit. If you're listening to the recording in the archive, you can join us for the next Kundalini After Dark meeting. You can visit brentspirit.com slash after dark to register. If you haven't already, you can like, subscribe, comment, follow, leave a rating, all that kind of stuff for the podcast, the YouTube channel. It goes a long, long way. Thank you so much. And to all those that have offered a donation at any point, thank you. It allows me to do this. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So let's jump into this here and talk about the benefits of Kundalini awakening. So some of us may have had, of course, a very challenging Kundalini awakening experience. I want to lead by acknowledging that, you know, this, this is really, really challenging, challenging process, challenging journey, challenging work. And uh, maybe you haven't really noted any benefits yet on your path. And so I want to empathize with you there. I know sometimes people can get a little a little bothered by some people describing bliss and ecstasy and oneness and unconditional love and everything working out and synchronicity. And then, you know, their experience is nothing like that whatsoever, right? They don't have any interesting phenomena, any interesting mystical experiences. It's just intensely difficult, dark, uncomfortable, scary, alone. So I understand that. And, and you know, we're here to support uh, support you in that just by being with you. And if you want to talk about it, we can talk about it today too. So you don't have to feel like you're you know, going to kill the vibe. It's all welcome here. However, I've noticed that many people who even have some benefits on the path, they tend to overlook those benefits and focus on the difficulty, right? It seems to be something uh, some of us tend to have as human beings, you know, and everything is going well. We look at the one thing that's not and focus there. Of course, it's maybe useful. We can focus on the problem and solve it rather than ignoring the problem and looking at all the things that are going well. So it makes sense. But I think uh, if we take some time now and then to contemplate the benefits, it can help us to kind of have a more balanced perspective, help us to stay in a state of empowerment and not fall into victimhood, and also to orient ourselves around this process, which is ultimately like the most incredible thing a human being can go through. It's it's incredibly healing. It's transformational, right? It's evolution. It's uh, in the big picture, in the long run, it's hopefully supposed to work out in, in a meaningful, positive way. So... Today, I want to focus a little bit on some of the upsides of this process. We'll talk a bit about the wins of the process, just to remind us that you know this, there is some good in this. It's not just something going completely wrong. This is not a curse, not at all, not at all. So you know, sometimes I, I come across people that may describe their awakening process, and they'll say, "Yeah, you know, my mind is uh, it's completely still. I used to have a lot of anxiety, but my mind got really quiet. But anyway, you know, all of these other things in my life is just going really." really, it's really hard. It's really challenging. I'm all alone. Nobody understands me. And and sure, we can talk about all of that, but I, you know, would like to at least point out like, Hey, by the way, like, you know, you're saying that your mind is clear. That's something that deserves a little bit of uh, recognition and, uh, you know, uh, to be sort of shine a spotlight on it now and then to remind us that, you know, this isn't just uh, things going wrong. So I've got a brief list here. Uh, first on my list, I've got uh, you know expansions of consciousness, right? So with this process, many come to see either in a fleeting moment or fleeting moments, or sometimes in a more sustainable way, we start to see directly through experience, through these shifts in consciousness, that we are not limited to this body or this mind, right? We can start to see this directly, experience it, feel it in our nervous system directly, and this is massive. This is massive, right? It helps us to move out of identification with the body, with the mind, which of course leads to suffering, right? If we take ourselves to be this mind, this ego, this body, then we are subject to, uh, you know, the world of suffering, right? We're subject to birth and death, right? Um, and that's challenging. Of course, 
you know, uh, some may argue that this is the the cause of all suffering, right? Is identification with the body and the mind, right? Taking ourselves to be only that, right? So with this process, we begin to have experiences where we recognize that there's something nameless, this omnipresent awareness, consciousness, right? It's it's non-local, and yet it's everywhere and nowhere, and that's what we really are, who we really are, and if we can access that space. It's very peaceful, it's spacious, it's freeing. And it also reminds us that, you know, we don't have to necessarily identify with our thoughts or emotions or even this body, right? We can play in this body and wear the mask of the ego, but we don't have to take ourselves to be it and take it so seriously, right? And like that, we become free, we become in a sense awakened or liberated. These are some of the themes that begin to emerge on the path. A major thing that can begin to arise is the fear of death begins to fall away as well. We begin, to, we begin to realize that with these expansions of consciousness, we see that the body will die. The mind will, you know, come to an end. But the awareness, the consciousness, you know, our true nature, that is eternal, beyond birth and death, beyond time and space, untouchable by any of the elements untouchable by death. So our fear of death begins to fall away as well, right? So that's a massive benefit. Some of us may experience states of oneness, oneness. Um, they don't necessarily need to be super flashy. Sometimes they come with a pretty far out mystical experience with all sorts of, uh, you know, visionary experiences and, and things like that, for sure. Ener energetic experiences, for sure. But sometimes the experiences of oneness can be very, very subtle. Right, this separation begins to fall away, or we begin to see through it. Right, we recognize that everything is actually all interconnected in some way. Right, it's this very beautiful experience. We see the truth of that. Right, and so it may be intermittent, it may be kind of flicker now and then, but this is a pretty profound experience that many of us can begin to have. And even if you've just had it for a brief, brief, fleeting split second, it's it's still a. Uh, uh, quite a revelation. It reveals a lot about reality about ourselves. And right, and that's a huge benefit that many can, can experience throughout this process. As well, we can begin to experience unconditional love. This can arise um, sometimes spontaneously. We just begin to, to feel this immense uh, unconditional love for all that is, right? Just wanting to embrace everything without judgment, right? All is welcome. Um, we call it loving kindness or metta. This can arise Sometimes spontaneously, um, sometimes in association with experiences of oneness or in association with the mystical experience, but sometimes it just arises just sort of uh, just, just in a very subtle way, this unconditional love for all that is. Um, it can also happen, it can be cultivated as well with this with this force of kundalini moving through our system. We can begin to cultivate all of this, uh, all of these states as well. We can begin to cultivate expanded states of consciousness. We cultivate, um, you know, uh, unitive, uh, states of, of awareness, right? Oneness we can begin to cultivate unconditional love as well, right? So we can, I would put my hands in my heart and just kind of feel that there's like an, a fire in my heart and I would stoke it with my breath. I would stoke it and I would say, I love you to everything that was arising, right? My thoughts, emotions, feelings, memories, my body, right? And then that would eventually expand outwards to embrace, you know, the whole universe, right? So these are things that we can begin to to access and through that, we begin to have this connection with something greater, right? We can call it God, call it goddess. We can call it our the universe or source, something greater, something greater. But we recognize that it's not something greater up there in the sky and we're just down here, these little you know lesser things. We realize that we're actually interconnected with that something greater. We are that, we are that. But of course, as we move through this process, ideally we come into a, a state where there's balance where we don't take it to, uh, you know, um, fuel grandiosity, but it's it fuels great confidence and simultaneously great humility as well, right? So there's a paradox there. We can begin to move into those experiences as well with with Kundalini. You know, sometimes people begin to recognize what they're really here to do, you know, on this earth, in this life. Um, the process will uh, shift us out of some sort of, you know, you could say egoic ideas about what we're here to do and actually align us with more like a heart um, centric mission or purpose typically has to do with some form of service. 
course, service because we recognize simultaneously that we're all one, we're all interconnected. It's all me. So naturally, we begin to want to serve. And so our, our mission can begin to be revealed to us um, to be of service. Now, of course, it doesn't mean we're going to be, you know, necessarily giving big talks to a big thousands of people or, you know, being a, become a New York Times bestseller or something like that. It doesn't have to be, not at all. But we become oriented around this idea of service. And so for some, service is, is very simple. It's, you know, everybody that they meet, they just offer them uh, a kind thought, a kind sentiment, a smile. This could be a great, uh, great act of service, recognizing that it's all us, it's all one, it's all interconnected, right? So for some people, a major um, challenge in their life is not knowing what they're really here to do, right? Not knowing, not having any orientation about what their real deep purpose is for being here. Um, and so the Kundalini awakening process can uh, reveal to us what we're here to do, right? It's to be of service in some way, in some way or another. So as this process unfolds in us, we begin to go through sometimes uh, an intense purification or purging experience where all sorts of emotions, thoughts begin to arise and can be very challenging or very challenging. But we develop our emotional intelligence, we begin to really see the nuances of emotions, begin to work with them without resistance, just accepting them, recognizing them, discerning them, right? So maybe perhaps before this process, we were, you know, maybe we just felt bad. As we go through this process, we become very emotionally intelligent. We're able to discern all the different flavors of bad, guilt, shame, resentment, jealousy, all these things can arise, sometimes multiple arising at the same time. And with our awareness, we become skilled and able to kind of feel out all of these different uh, emotions and their qualities and even make sense of, you know, what they, their purpose, why they arise sometimes, because they all have a purpose, right? So this can happen as we go through the purging and the purification period. And as we develop our own emotional intelligence, we begin to be more gentle with ourselves, more loving with ourselves. And then that helps us to develop empathy for others. So we can really begin to empathize with other people and their emotional experience and how challenging it must be for them, right? Because we've been through like this really intense training dealing with our own emotions, thoughts, experiences. So then we're able to look at another person and say, ah, I know what they might be going through because I, I went through something like that. So I can I can understand. It makes us you know, better, better um, at service, right? Better at service, better in relationships kinder to ourselves as well, right? I think um, emotional intelligence, empathy with the dawning of AI, I think that um, the most important thing that we can all cultivate and we can I ideally teach uh, our, our children to cultivate is emotional intelligence, right? It, we don't necessarily need to be super book smart anymore, right? AI's got that all handled. But the emotional intelligence, that's the next frontier that robots can't do for us. And, you know, nobody has really taught us this, um, you know, in school per se, right? So I think this is like a whole new dimension for us to begin to develop in. And if you happen to be going through Kundalini Awakening, well, then, uh, you know, um, it's like a fast track training course for dealing with your own emotions. So the last point I have on my list, and then I'm going to open up the floor for others to share as well, is I have a more relaxed nervous system, right? So as we purge, we, we purify, we heal, we become more empathetic, we cultivate more safety in our body, knowing that it's all me, knowing that we're not this body or this mind anyway, so we can feel safe knowing that, you know, death can't really touch who we are so we can relax. We feel safe, we feel calm, that cultivates a state of peace, right? That's what healing is. And so the Kundalini awakening process is ultimately a healing process. Healing is messy, it's difficult, it's challenging at times. That's why for some, they may say there's no benefits to this process. This sucks. And I understand, right? If you're in surgery, somebody's trying to heal you, but they're cutting you open, there's blood, it's a mess, you know? Of course it sucks. In the big picture, there's growth, there's healing. And so in the long term, you can look forward to a more relaxed nervous system. So people may say, what is the kundalini all about what are the benefits of kundalini awakening we can talk about all sorts of these far out things you know siddhis psychic powers and you know third eye stuff and shakti pot this and connecting with other beings that and you know that's all cool stuff for sure i mean I, I talk about that all the time i love it but ultimately we can boil it down to this one simple thing just a more relaxed nervous system more relaxed nervous system and that contains it all right because everybody on earth 
likely would want a more relaxed nervous system. It makes sense, right? Because from there, everything tends to fall into place and come together. So that's what I've come to understand as the ultimate benefit of the Kundalini awakening process is relaxed nervous system. And it doesn't have to be permanently relaxed, right? It can ebb and flow, it can flicker, it can be intermittent. But there's something about with this process, once the energy is flowing through the system, it seems that we don't tend to hold on to things as much anymore because that flow is constantly just clearing things out. Whereas in the past, we may have accumulated all sorts of stress in our nervous system. Now we accumulate stress and quite quickly, it seems to be uh, released, right? So we don't hold on for too long. So I'll open the floor up now for others to share about the benefits of Kundalini Awakening. Maybe you've got some thoughts, some pushback. Maybe you've got some questions for the group. Maybe something intense is on your mind. Uh, you have some questions, you have some responses, and we're here to hear you out and, and to support one another. You can type in the chat. You can uh, jump on the call on audio or video. I want to invite you to check out kundaliniawareness.org. It's uh, a website that I was inspired to create to raise awareness about Kundalini, duh. Um, we've got a registry of licensed mental health professionals with direct personal lived Kundalini experience. Perhaps there's someone in your area that you have a connection with and you can you know, work with them as your uh, counselor or therapist. Uh, so that's the directory. We've also got a collection of stories about people that have gone through Kundalini Awakening or are going through it. So they've written their story out. You can read, you can relate, you can get excited about some of those stories. They're very fascinating. So thank you if you submitted your story already. If you haven't and you would like to, please uh, make a submission. We'd love to have your story in the collection. We've also got uh, some peer support groups. Um, if you'd like to uh, to find some more support online, um, there's a bunch of resources as well, books, videos, talks, et cetera. So kundaliniawareness.org, it's like a bit of a landing page uh, for Kundalini. I've tried to make it uh, sort of easily digestible for somebody who may stumble upon it, who's you know not super familiar with what this is. So maybe if you feel like it might be a, something to share with a, a friend or a family member who may be wondering what the hell you're talking about, kundaliniawareness.org. Noemi says, how do I handle a large shift in sensitivity? I'm in a stage of my life where I'm being challenged in my new job to be more present, patient, and releasing control. I've been so sensitive this past couple of weeks. I've been feeling so deeply about everything and it's a lot for me. I know that sensitivity is a good thing, but what can I do to support myself in this discomfort? The theme of my life lately has been learning to be comfortable in the uncomfortable, which is easier said than done. Does anyone have advice or resonate at all? Yeah, that sounds really challenging, uh, Noemi. New job, new stage of life, being challenged to be more present, patient, and releasing control, right? So I welcome others. If you have something for uh, Noemi, you can raise your hand. You can type in the chat. A couple of things coming to me. So I like what you're sharing here about... Um, the theme of your life lately has been learning to be comfortable in the uncomfortable, which is easier said than done. So for sure, like I was speaking earlier about, you know, unconditional love for all of the emotions, the thoughts, the feelings, the sensations, right? Embracing it all, right? Finding comfort, comfort in the discomfort for sure. But when it comes to work, I feel inclined to emphasize self-care here. But rather than saying, you know, I'm going to be totally accepting of my state of stress and burnout actually you self-care right we can self-care don't have to just rest in the discomfort of say uh, being fatigued or burnt out right now, i know you're not necessarily speaking about burnout directly here but because you're speaking about work and new job yeah it's hard to be present when we are taxed when our nervous system is taxed it's hard to be present for sure it's hard to be patient as well. Yeah. So depending on what the role is, especially if it's in like a, a service role, like, you know, you're doing some sort of healing in some capacity or another, right? Which doesn't mean like you're, you know, a doctor or something. It could mean that you're just dealing with people that are coming to your store because you sell something that helps people's lives get easier and they always come to you when they're stressed out. So, you know, you're serving them. Um. You know, we sometimes can run into compassion fatigue, right? Get burnt out, can't really find a compassionate place in us to, to meet other people from. 
you know? So that's why self-care is very, very important. We burn out. It's not easy to be uh, empathetic, compassionate, present, patient, like you're sharing here. Uh, so you're sharing here about being in a clinical setting, working with kids. Yeah, yeah. So definitely, definitely self-care is important. Definitely. Sherwin's sharing here about grounding and nature activities have helped me with the sensitivity. Yeah. Yeah. Nature, grounding, all, all very helpful as well. Soothe the nervous system. Yeah, it's hard to be sensitive sometimes. Sometimes we do have to put up some boundaries as well. It can be hard with kids, I imagine, though, right? Hard to say no. Some boundaries with work, all these types of things. All comes under the self-care umbrella, of course. Let's go over here to Tom. Hi. Hey, Tom. Uh, I just want the only thing I could think of that I've done recently, and so it's only fairly recently since I stopped working, but um, just to con when I get when I get into the state of being kind of flustered with things that I'm in. Uh, a group or dealing with people. I bring myself back to that that silly thing of a of, of well, what will the mind of, th of to think? What will the mind think next? And that kind mm. of separates me from from emotion that I was maybe caught up in, and from any thoughts because I'm just watching again, watching the thoughts. It kind of helps me. I don't know if it'll help you do that, but if you try it, it might. Uh, just separate yourself a bit, like become, become the witness more than being caught up in them. Working, I've, I've done volunteer work with the kids in the hospital and long time ago, and I found it was uh, very challenging, very, very, very challenging. They were in for, you know, little kids or who are in pain or, yeah, I couldn't do it uh, for a length of time. So uh, really, uh, showing a lot of courage uh to to deal with that that emotion that comes comes out in that that setting but anyway yeah just try try that's all i can think of uh, that separation uh which which puts you uh somewhat in control uh again anyway mm -hmm. sorry i can't be of more help but that's all well, that's, I it's, it's very helpful tom thank you thank you and um, Serpent Power shares here, high-protein diet and exercise are immensely helpful in balancing your hormones and nervous system, right? For me, meditation is is the number one thing I turn to for self-care, right? It's just either facing whatever's coming up directly, which is, you know, we're helping to process those things, and also just training our nervous system to be more present by default, practicing the state of presence as well. That's my number one thing. Let's see about some of the benefits here. We've got uh, Hugo sharing some of the benefits of Kundalini. Quiet mind, presence, authenticity, knowing that my thoughts create connection, less reactivity, observation, stepping out of character, quote-unquote character, more empathetic, speaks his mind great alchemist frequency healer says always have energy running throughout my body fascinating lots of great benefits there uh, hugo alchemist frequency healer got olga sharing some benefits here as well olga says one of the benefits for me is that i naturally change my diet without the sensation of sacrifice my body simply would no longer crave meat or sodas or any unhealthy food. Very interesting. Yeah, so I've heard this from a couple other people as well, where after their awakening, just suddenly like they're they just like shift to a much healthier lifestyle. Um, I don't think that happened to me directly. One thing that comes to me... Alcohol, the smell of alcohol became repulsive. Like just clearly, like I just could smell it and like it was like my body was like, do not put that in me. That's one thing that happened. Yeah. But I think cravings begin to cease. What I've recognized is that many cravings that we have 
are a self-soothing mechanism to overcome some emotional difficulty, right? So when we feel bored or lonely or anxious, maybe we might crave a certain food, which gives us some, you know, good feelings, some dopamine to make those, and it makes those uncomfortable emotions kind of go away. But Kundalini says, no, we're going to face those emotions. We're going to uproot them, heal them, purge them, purify them. So if the emotions aren't there, well, the craving doesn't have to necessarily arise, right? So Gabor Mate says like, you know, now I'm not, I'm, uh, oh God, I'm going off a little bit here. I'm not saying that, you know, you're speaking about addiction per se, but Gabor Mate says, um, you know, don't ask why the addiction, ask why the pain, why the pain. Right. So all of these things that we crave seem to be to overcome some pain in some way. So let's go over here to Charlie. Hello, how are you? Hey, Charlie, I'm good. How are you? Oh, I'm doing wonderful. Hey, I really resonate. I just saw your thing on YouTube. I, I subscribed to your channel and then I, uh, I saw you doing a live. So I decided to jump on the Zoom. Um, and I just want to say, I really appreciate what you're doing. And I, I mean, I wish I had found some, something like you, you know, uh, years ago when I first was going through it, cause it's like, you're going through this experience, you're feeling the energies, you don't know what's going on. Everybody around you is like, I don't know what they're, you know, and, um, I would just say that from my experience, you know, what I've learned the most that's been the most helpful for me is is really is grounded you know and i've learned you know to you know during a meditation to become you know aware of my feet and actually kind of breathe you know pushing that just like connecting to the earth you know breathing through my feet that just immediately because a lot of times with the kundalini awakening i've noticed the energy tends to rise and it, and it gets up here a lot. So it's like, you know, and especially if your mind is still in the, you know, it's not pure yet. Like you're going to have a lot of thoughts. You're going to be, so there's so much energy, but I would say to anybody who's going through it and having a difficult experience, I would say from somebody who's gone through a lot of that, I would say on the other side of that, the bliss is so, I mean, it's just, out of this world you know you just be walking along and just everything just like it's just hit you with bliss and it's just it's such a beautiful thing but all of those emotions it they it does it's all the purging process so yeah but anyway beautiful. thanks again for uh for sharing. it's really cool oh thank you it's great to have you here and and for sharing that uh very uh hopeful hopeful message yeah one of the first things that uh this energy healer that uh, I connected with very early on in my path, one of the first things she told me was um, to breathe into my feet because I was telling her, like, I feel like I'm like out of my body. There's like a volcano erupting in my head. She's like, breathe into your feet. And she was very sensitive energetically. So she kind of put her hands near my feet and she was like, okay, breathe into your feet. And she was checking to make sure I was doing it right because she could kind of feel the the energy. Right. So. It's uh, it's really powerful. So thank you for uh, for that uh, that share. Yeah, very simple but powerful for sure. Yeah, thank you. I th that's really cool. I think that that's a, such a key thing. And it's like we talk so much about the chakras, but the feet are actually the first chakra. I think they call it the earth chakra. Um, yeah. and it's uh, yeah. I I think there's like a quote from a famous Taoist alchemist who was talking about like you know, something about, you know, breathing through your feet and how it's so important because, it, you know, staying grounded, I think is the main challenge. Um, and as far as like sensitivity goes, I think my response to that was like, you get used to it. You get used to the like, different awareness of time and emotions and also like other people's energy. Sometimes you're so sensitive that you can kind of get pulled in. And it's just like you're switching dimensions and you're kind of like, it's a, it just takes time to, you know, to get used to. Yeah. Great, great insight. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie.
Appreciate you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Let's go over here to uh, Derek and then Dr. Shiram. How are you? Hanging in there. Not too bad. Going again, kind of going through a rough time, but uh, uh, whew, sensitivity, sensitivity. I think I, I've always personally been super sensitive. Um, I've noticed, you know, having this happen to me. Um, and I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's like just, you know, these are, what can I say, uh, blocked emotions or whatever, or just, you know, traumas that I, I keep mentioning my face all the time. It's always like tight here, but it seems like lately, you know, I want to have a good cry. Um, yesterday kind of happened, but then my body just kind of stops, you know, last time I just feel like each time I have like this like intense cry, it's like my face just kind of it like sends more energy up for some reason. And my face just gets like super tight. I don't know if it's like my body's like, it's, it's like a, you know, just this fear. Um, my body's just like afraid of it saying, no, my mind is saying, no, be calm. And my, my body's saying, no, stop. Cause it doesn't want to break through. I mean, now in my head, it's like, there's just so much pressure in my head at the moment. I had to take a, a benzodiazepine and it's like radiating from the side. And I'm thinking it's probably, I'll be having one of those experiences you've mentioned, like, you know, just like that you use the metaphor of the champagne um, bottle, just ready to, ready to erupt. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I want to actually be, I'm, I'm naturally sensitive action. I'd love, I'd love to be crying all the time, but I just, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm essentially I'm, I'm, I'm opening a floodgate this way somehow. I don't know. Mm. I guess anybody, yeah. anybody can relate. And even if I eat, sometimes it's like I said, it still kind of makes things worse. Sometimes it's better because I feel grounded, but sometimes it's just like, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, well, thanks for opening up, Derek. Um, yeah, it sounds like you're having a hard time with the crying. Is it that you you would like to cry, but it's hard to cry? Is that part of what's happening? Yeah, it's like, yeah. I, I think I, I think it's a good thing to cry. Like, I don't, I've never had any issues crying. Like, I think I've cried all my life. And, um, but uh, yeah, it seems like, um, like when I do cry, actually, you know, going through this. Um, so like maybe let's say a year, I don't know how long it's been, um, probably a year is, but like I said, it's it's really since I had the ayahuasca maybe two years ago that and then just months, months after that, that things just like, whoa, I'm thinking this is this is what it is. Um that um when I do cry, it's really like it's really intense. I mean, I'm actually I mean pretty much like shaking, you know, just like sobbing, howling almost. Yeah. Um, so, and at the same time, it always, I always, it like, it's almost like my face tightens up even more and I can feel like there's just something trying to like, just come up and I'm, you know, right. so yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm curious if any, anyone has felt something like that similar or, yeah. and actually yeah, well, if, food, if food made it worse, like if food's kind of fueling it at the same time, it's just like pushing it and I'm, and I want to kind of give into it, you know, like, uh, like do like like i said like a surya kriya or something but then i'm afraid of of like it blasting out of my head being super blissful and at the same time my digestion is so bad i'm not able to eat like normal things i mean I'm, i don't really eat much of, of anything um and then just having this you know kind of experience of being depersonalized because i'm not able to ground it fast enough or something which is which quite which is quite traumatic um for me a couple months ago so yeah well, well, thanks for for opening up, Derek. I can I can relate a little bit. Actually, I can open up and say, like, right now, I it would be nice to have a good cry for me. It hasn't come yet. Um, I'm sure at some point it will, but it is. I I can relate a little bit where I feel this sort of uh like a sneeze coming, but I can't quite sneeze yet. It's it's like that, except crying. Um, I recently read a book. Uh, maybe relevant. So some here in the group, I'm um, not saying it's for you specifically, Derek, but there's an interesting chapter in Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. And he describes there about healing from a lot of, you know, challenging uh, experiences from childhood particular, in particular um, that sort of make up uh, what we may call complex PTSD. Of course, this is not therapy here. We're just people on the internet talking. It's a great book. But in that book, he has a, a bit of a section where he describes uh, some techniques for how to cry if it's something that you're having difficulty with. Um, one thing he, I think he says is like, sometimes there's rage that needs to be expressed first. 
And after the rage gets out, then there's like a, now I can grieve and cry. So sometimes there's emotions that are sort of first in line before the big release and the grief. Um, something to consider there, but it's a great book. I highly recommend uh, that book to anybody who may be interested in those types of things. Uh, excellent. But thank you so much, Derek, for for sharing today. I, I hope some others in the chat can offer you some some insight and support. Let's go over here to Dr. Sri Ram. Hi there. Namaste. Uh, Namaste. I'd just like to share uh, my experience. Uh, so I had my Kundalini awakening about a couple of months back. I see myself as a baby in the Kundalini awakening world. And my experience has been predominantly uh, positive and I'm so grateful for it. Um, I've been practicing yoga for over 30 years uh, since the childhood. And uh, some of the benefits uh, of Kundalini awakening were mind blowing experiences in my own uh, yoga practice. And uh, some of the revelations that I receive almost on a daily basis. So just to give a couple of examples, um, I noticed that uh, when spontaneous kriyas happen and uh, spontaneous asanas that my body goes into, uh, some of the asanas are practices that I had not done for decades. And uh, suddenly it gets expressed through my body. And some of the breath work, pranayama, that come spontaneously, um, and uh, for example, the uh, almost on a daily basis, spontaneous uh, shitali pranayama happens, which is uh, breathing in through the mouth, and that cools down the system. Perhaps uh, it's a natural way to, uh, like an air conditioning system for the body, and uh, Kundalini knows how to heat or cool the system. And uh, so when that happens, I'm in a state of wonder. Wow, uh, there are so many uh, knobs and buttons to bring harmony, more uh, prana flow in the body that is in harmony uh, for the body and mind. And uh, uh, I also learned that some of the practices I was doing uh, incorrectly, uh, or rather incorrect is a strong word, maybe not in the best uh, possible expression of the postures or the breath work. Um, so I, I feel as if, uh, uh, for example, learning music directly from Mozart, or Bach. So learning directly from Kundalini, how to practice this breath work or how to do this asana. So this is really mind blowing. And uh, one last thing I will say is uh, while doing spontaneous uh, uh, mudras, the hand gestures. So I noticed that uh, many of the standard well-known mudras happen automatically in my hands. And I was also blessed to receive uh, mudras that are not documented yet. And I also consulted with my teacher back in India. And uh, some new mudras are uh, coming out through these uh, expressions. And I'm, I'm fascinated by it. Like, it's, 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 it's amazing. So as you see, I'm in a state of wonder. And uh, I just wanted to share that with the group. And also to thank you, Brent, for the extraordinary work that you are doing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you don't strike me as a baby in this process at all. So I appreciate your humility. Um, I think your example is one of the rare examples of someone who has been preparing for this directly with yogic practices prior to the major you know, energetic opening. Many of us have not had 30 years of yoga practice at all, whereas it seems like uh, you know, you've been putting in a lot of work. Would you mind sharing a little bit more with the group about your 30 years of practice and you know the awakening experience, I think that may contextualize a little bit for why you're saying, hey, today, hey, it's going really well, you know, not much difficulty necessarily. Yes, uh, so I started learning yoga when I was uh, 11 years old. Um, as many people, my entry into yoga was through the practice of uh, posture, the asana. And that was just the entry point, my first, uh, 10 years of my practice was predominantly a posture. And uh, I began uh, appreciating the role of uh, breath work, pranayama, uh, a little later. So after 10 years of, first 10 years of my practice, and I noticed that the power of uh, breath regulation 
so it can take me to deeper and deeper states of bliss beyond what the uh, just physical practice of asana give to the body and mind so i was uh, blown away by the uh, breathing practices and uh, so in the last uh, about 20 years or so i've been practicing a holistic and i believe that is how yoga uh, sadhana should be practiced a holistic like ashtanga yoga uh, practice of uh, uh, ethics as the foundation ethics in life living a life of integrity and um, in the daily sadhana inside the yoga mat the practice of postures breath work deep relaxation meditation and so forth and uh, uh, i uh, in res- in retrospect i realized that uh, i have had glimpses of this uh, kundalini bliss even much before awakening and uh, the difference i see is that after the awakening um i mean it's like a big giant magnifying glass has uh, you know expanded the experience of uh, bliss and uh, i'm i'm so grateful for it and this awakening happened um spontaneously in one of my uh, meditation sessions and uh, at that time i was uh, totally unprepared for it i had no idea what was happening and my body was uh, spontaneously moving in uh, mudras my hands were going into mudras and uh, uh various dance gestures that i have seen before in the indian classical dance and uh, i was uh, uh blown away by it and i had no idea that my body could do that because i was not trained as a dancer so that was a very uh, amazing experience and uh, i later found out that these are the uh, kundalini kriya and uh, the material that you have on youtube that was so uh, helpful to me and in fact as the last couple of months i've been uh, devouring all your uh, material that you have so i'm very grateful for that oh thank you well now uh you know people are going to devour your contribution as well so thank you so much for for sharing and stopping by very inspiring very inspiring um fascinating fascinating appreciate it a lot thank you thank you, thank you. so let's go here to Mihar Mira. Hi, Mehar here. Hi there. First time joining. I uh, really appreciate your channel. Uh, so I've only understood in hindsight that what I have been having is a Kundalini experience. Um, and I've experienced the, I practice TM. I have been doing transcendental meditation for two years now. I had my first, what I would say, um, the experience of like finding the light in absolute darkness was pretty much the first day of the experience probably because i went in with a lot of innocence and that that was key um uh have been very much interested in the spiritual realm um also the scientific inquiry of it um however one particular incident i wanted to share and probably get insight from the group is so the energy the kundalini energy i started to get aware of um you know uh, the bliss or the experience of like something feeling um naturally um uh you know a, a a spray of bliss like for example in my forehead throughout my shoulders um especially right after my meditation practice something i would say to my teacher is like i feel like somebody put my brain in the dishwasher and it just came out and i have a lot more energy now a uh, one particular incident that has happened recently is that my kundalini energy is speaking to me that something's not right um that is some someone someone in your environment is trying to hurt you or they're lying to you or they're not being honest and i have experienced a sudden disruption at work due to politics uh but there was a ball of fire that went up and down my spine during a certain uh conversation with uh two of my peer managers around me and at that time I never doubted them I just thought I was having a hot flash and two months later I realized they both had been trying to like frame me on certain things and talking about emotional intelligence I could see through everything but there was a part of me that was like no you're overthinking this as if my subconscious was keeping track and putting a pin on every single lie every single like something that was out of the ordinary but the lying was something that was caught by my kundalini energy so much that it would it would hit me from the inside and it would force me to like look through things and 
Uh, the emotional intelligence definitely took care of me during this time because I wasn't emotionally attached to them, even though one of them posed themselves um, as my number one supporter and whatnot. A part of me was just laughing about what has just happened if somebody else has uh, shown their true colors to me without me even trying because I started practicing Taoist philosophy at work and even without me trying things were starting to come up and that purging happened and the clearing of the karma started happening very very fast but I'm very curious like how do you pay attention to kundalini energy speaking with you because I had a very similar experience where I was feeling that somebody's trying to force me into something. And it's not something harmful. It's just that we're not aligning on something. And I'm feeling a little bit pushed or because I'm highly independent also. And I I see anything where somebody is forcing me into something or persuading me into something, even if it's a dinner or a concert, I feel like that is an encroachment of my individuality. And I come back to my apartment and I feel like somebody wrangled me physically. And that's like as if somebody had held me and physically wrangled me for a while. And I could feel those hands around me, even though this person is, is a friend. She never really touched me. So all those ways are how I'm experiencing the Kundalini energy speaking to me. I also have a lot of time to myself right now because I'm taking some time off work, uh, figuring out what I want to do next in life. But how do I take care of myself through this? That would be the second part of the question. And first would be, is this Kundalini energy speaking to me about my environment around me? Fascinating experiences. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing. If others have some thoughts, please um, share in the chat or, or jump on the call here. Uh, I've got a couple points. Um, it seems that some have a sort of uh, direct line to the intelligence of Kundalini at certain times, which I like to refer to her as the divine mother. So she, she will indicate to you, sometimes it's when things are true. So people will hear the name of a book and they light up energetically or they have a Kriya and it's basically saying, read that book or they hear a name of somebody or they come across a video on YouTube and they start having Kriyas. They know oh, this is the right video or the right person that I should be listening to at this moment. Um, so for example, I, I interviewed Dr. Yvonne Kaysan. She's uh, done a lot of great work with uh, Kundalini research and uh, spiritually transformative experiences, near-death experiences. She was one of the earliest uh, in the West to discuss Kundalini. And um, she had a Kundalini awakening. And her meditation group that she was a part of, they mentioned Gopi Krishna, who was uh, from India at the time. And he was uh, also very much involved in kundalini research and so she hears this name of gopi krishna and her she starts having like huge uh, um you know energetic experiences kriyas um her, her spine the energy is going up and down and she recognizes it's saying look more into gopi krishna go and visit him in india right all the way from canada go go to india go so she actually ended up going to, to india and meeting gopi krishna so it was like this communication so i can imagine that conversely not just for when things are true or good or it's the next step also the kundalini is uh, uh, omniscient she can even say hey these people uh are not uh healthy for you pay attention um then of course you know en enforce more boundaries or, or you know get out of the situation whatever it may be um i i feel like Though I'm sure there are some people who their kundalini communicates with them on a daily basis, many times throughout the day, helping them to make decisions here and there. But I also feel like sharing that for some, it may be that the kundalini gives us some training so that we can recognize certain themes and then she kind of backs off and lets us figure it out on our own. So we may not always have these this, these alarms going off if somebody is, you know, trying to lie to us or cheat us or manipulate us. We may not always have these, you know, bells dinging if there's a book that we need to read, but we can tune into the frequency directly and no longer need to hear, you know, the or, or experience those like um, clear signs from the Kundalini. But I'm sure there are some people who, you know, they regularly experience some clear signs. Um, I, I've, I'm rambling too much. I didn't even get your sec, the second part of your question if I even address the first one. Um, the second part of your question was about managing the sensitivity, was it? like? Um... Hi. Yeah, so um, 
I was saved by the Kundalini energy in what was happening at work. I feel like the emotional intelligence kicked in and uh, there was less damage than there would have been. Uh, absolute victory the way it was handled, uh, where I had to advocate for myself, be very clear. And every day I had extra guidance on how to move forward because I was not only meditating, but also chanting. I started mm -hmm. doing the Nishire and chanting also because that's when I felt like immense connection to that particular chant. I had never felt that much connection. But right now I'm in a phase where I have to like take care of myself um, I am not going to work right now. Uh, it's my first week. I just wrapped up of my medical leave, uh, because I was thrown into a nervous breakdown, which is great. Sure. Everything happened because it was supposed to that way. How do I take care of myself during this time? Uh, how do I continue to seek guidance or strengthen this, you know, life force in myself, given the the benefit of time and resources that I now have. Mm -hmm. I have my insurance, I have my therapist helping me out, but the spiritual aspect of this, there is this, mm -hmm. there's this calling to channel all the psychic abilities, all the powers for the greater good. It's there. I just don't know how to like nail it down and start the process. Mm. Great, great. Yeah. So definitely take advantage of every resource that you can maybe not all at once but whatever feels right absolutely so i'm i'm a big very big on self care as opposed to getting involved in super crazy spiritual practices the spiritual stuff kind of takes care of itself which is you know the kundalini intelligence we just have to kind of just main just maintain the system while it's happening um i i kate west from when lightning strikes she said something along the lines of you know we just have to keep our body alive. Kundalini will take care of the rest. So you can, you know, consider that. But of course, we don't have to, we can do more than just keep our body alive. We can, of course, you know, do all the self-care stuff. Therapy is great. Um, I like to think that I, when it comes to giving your gifts, service, being called into the world, I've framed my my entire life as I'm just an employee. I didn't ask for this. I didn't ask for this job. The Shakti, the goddess, came and said, hey, Brent, I want you to work for me. I said, oh, okay. Are you going to train me? Are you going to show me what to do? Are you going to make it easy for me? And Shakti says, absolutely. Just show up. I'll take care of the rest. So that's my attitude is just show up and wait. And something will happen. If nothing happens, well, you're not the boss. You're just the employee. The boss has to make things happen. You don't. So that's the way I see it. So I found that to be a very like low pressure game to play when it comes to service. You show up, you say, God, my hands are yours. My mouth is yours. My energy is yours. My body is yours. Use me. And if, if nothing happens, well, then I'm just going to just chill and take care of my body and rest and meditate and read books and whatever. But if there's something more to happen, well, God, make it happen. So that's my attitude when it comes to, to service. Uh, in the meantime, though, definitely uh, self-care self-care so uh, thank you so much uh for sharing we've got lots of uh insights here in the chat um kundalini king on youtube says shares here journaling reading writing play lots of music dance get out of nature totally yeah, these things eventually begin to evolve into service in some way they just start to evolve this is what i've noticed ideas come while you're out in nature inspiration comes while you're out in nature taking care of yourself or how you may be able to take care of others too so it's kind of kind of works like that hi brent hi there phoebe um just um sharing my situation and it might help others i learned very early on that i had to learn to communicate with my body because mine is such a physical journey um you know, with, with the illness side of it, things like that. So I have to be careful with every move. So um, learning kinesiology was imperative for me to start communication well with my body. And the finger kinesiology, and you could do it standing up and different other ways as well. Because, um, you know, like I started like working with the emotional side of it, I worked with flower essences and you know I had a kit and things like that and I would have to 
pull the flower essences that the body wanted for the day and ask how, you know, what ones she wanted, how many times a day she wanted them and things like that. So that I worked like that for a few years and I never had to go through the big emotional traumas that many seem to have because the flower essences did the work for me. So, you know, there's lots of things to learn to make the journey easier. And I had sort of no idea of that flower essences. It's just my naturopath gave me um, a bottle one day and I thought, well, what are these? And I just went away and found out about them. And that's how it led to that journey. And then you get to a point where you no longer need the flower essences. You're doing it yourself. So, you know, that just can take years off the emotional side of the journey. Um and the other thing is I use that kinesiology every day because now I have to use the mudras. Um, you know, I, I would do them several hours a day every day to keep my body running because I've lost the automatic functioning of my body. Um, and so I have to go in manually and help it. And so because I wake up and it's obvious what ones I need to do, but then sometimes I'm not sure, so I'll go through and I'll be asking her, do you want this one done? How long do you want it done for? Things like that. So I'm really becoming one with the body for the process and I'm creating healing paths that never existed before for myself and my lineage. Um, and these are just tools that, I, you know, that just aren't out there enough um, to make the process easier for people. They're just left floundering of what to do and trying to find their way forward. Um, so you're just sharing that. Now, at the moment, I'm having terrible trouble with um, low blood pressure, which is a problem with my journey. And the regular mudra I was doing was just not working anymore. And I thought, I'm just going to be bed bound again. And so I went on to YouTube and there you go, you know, just there it is. Someone's done the work and put another um, podcast up on a mudra that is for low blood pressure that no one else has presented before and so I'm doing that and you know they said it can take about a week to work well for me it was instant because I'm doing so many mudras so it can kick in quicker um, yeah so just for every stage of what you're feeling going through there's basically a mudra but you have to learn how to use them so uh, it's a matter of getting some good um, some good books on that and so much help on YouTube as well. So just for all the emotional side and that even, you know, if I didn't have the flower essences now, I'd be doing mudras. Um, so, you know, if you can't release something and it's all pent up, you know, they will just, there's a de beautiful detox mudra that I do most days and that works on, toxic emotions and toxicity in the body and so instead of being left struggling with this release it with you know everything has actually been provided we just need to know about it and then keep learning how to use it incredible thank you bb for sharing fascinating stuff and i i uh i, I saw in the chat earlier i think um Somebody mentioned as well, they have mudras daily, spontaneously, but they don't know what they mean or, or what their significance is. I think you have an interesting experience there where you, through, I guess, maybe you could say grace or through synchronicity or through the flow, you came to find the right mudra for you. So this is something I've noticed as well. Sometimes the intelligence of Shakti will teach us inwardly, right? Spontaneously, we'll be guided, we'll be shown. Sometimes we may even have direct uh, teachings, like a lesson um, on top of the spontaneous phenomena. But other times I've noticed that she will draw us to a particular video or talk or conversation or person, and they have what we need at the time. So the teachings come, come from internally or externally, but they're always, uh, they always show up at the right time, it seems. It's quite fascinating, Phoebe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Noemi is sharing some... Uh, Benefits of Kundalini Awakening here. No longer interested in surface level or fake relationships. Desire to learn more about myself. Strong curiosity. Increase in intuition. Increased empathy and knowing our connection to other living things and the universe. 
increase in personal strength, change in diet. And she closes with et cetera, et cetera. Yes, there's just an endless amount of benefits for sure. Hi, guys. Hey, hey how are you guys? Good, good. How are you? I miss I missed the beginning of the call. What is the what is the purple eyebrows? Uh the purple eyebrows, is that my uh is that my glasses? Is that what you mean? Oh, that's what it is. Oh, okay. I thought it was like, like a filter. Okay. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> uh it's the okay. reflection of the of the light. Oh yeah, a cool. few a few people okay. like have been like, hey, like before we before we start this really serious call, Brent, did you know you have a filter on? And I'm like, no, like, yeah, it looks real. like that. Yeah, sorry, I have. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's okay. So it's okay. <laughs> um, I was gonna say that's a benefit. Purple eyebrows, that's a benefit. Uh, one second, let me get away from the loud lawnmower. Okay, yeah, my question. Um, so I love the topic of the call of just benefits. I would say one of the benefits is like. Like it's been one year since my pretty like acute, like the awakening really, you know, picking up speed and it feels like it's been five years, like in that year. So I think just the supersonic growth that can ha happen in like such a short time is a huge benefit. Um, But I did want to ask about uh something that the first time it happened was in like 2015. But I've picked up this, like, this is, I wouldn't say it's a, be it's like, I think it's meant to be a benefit, but it doesn't really necessarily always, isn't always helpful. Um, but like dissociative, dissociating, so like out of body experiences. Um, the first one I have that happened to me, I was in eating disorder treatment and I like couldn't even taste anything in my mouth and there wasn't any huge external trigger. Um, but it was really extreme. Like I couldn't feel my body at all. And then now it'll happen just like in semi-stressful environments <laughs> where, like, where all of a sudden I'm just like, like I really exit the body and I'm, I'm learning how to work with it and how to like meditate in those spaces. But I think it's meant to be a benefit because it's like, oh, this is stressful. Let's exit the situation. But it's obviously not always ideal. Um, it's a coping mechanism. So I guess what I'm wondering is um, if people have had that with Kundalini, because it could also be like a CPTSD response or, you know, dissociative anxiety or so I haven't really resolved it. It's gotten a lot better with meditation, um, but I'm just trying to figure out out of body experiences or like dissociative events and it, it being connected to Kundalini awakening, or, you know, is that something that can just happen to people that like learn that as a subconscious coping mechanism? Mm, right. Yeah. So um, thank you for, for opening up about that. It, it seems that it's actually quite common for those going through Kundalini awakening to have, you know, um, dissociation or some might describe it as being spaced out or ungrounded or leaving the body, checking out, um, depersonalization, these types of things. Of course, we are um, just people on the internet having a conversation. This is not medical advice. Yeah. It's not therapy, none of that. Okay, please consult with your doctor. And I, I really uh, I encourage, uh, if you're having some serious difficulties, um, experiences, you know, talking to a therapist, a doctor. Well, I have. Yeah, 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 I have. And they don't usually know what I'm talking about, like to yeah. that degree. So I think it's Kundalini connected. Right. So the way that I kind of uh, of, of conceptualize this, now this is just my conceptualization, um, though I, I don't think I'm the only one. It's this idea of, it's a sort of meditative space that we begin to access, except it's not balanced because it doesn't include the body, it's the senses. It's, a, it's, a, it's just totally up here and above. We kind of go into this spaciousness, right? And um, it seems that this is like a built-in sort of trauma response, right? If we can't fight, we can't flee. We can check out and at least not be in the body when there's, you know, stress or abuse happening and things like that. So um, in that space, what I've understood from my own personal experience is that there's great insight, actually. 
um, if you've got the spiritual context, you can really get a lot of insight because it shows you like, hey, I can actually go to a place that's not in my body. So what does that mean? Like, it means that we're not this body. There's something more to us than this body. It's that we're the consciousness, right? Um, so some states of meditation, like, uh, you know, they may be meant to sort of invoke these, what, you know, our, our medical, the medical field would call dissociation. Um, but through meditation, you can invoke it um, as a way to gain insight. Um, it's also a tool that some meditators or people with Kundalini, for example, can begin to actually develop as a skill that they may use during, like they may use it consciously during times where they are under duress. So this is why in some cases with meditation, you're able to transcend pain, right? Because you have this ability to go into the spaciousness, right? Um, and you developed it consciously. So, um, you know, you may see some monks who in protest, maybe they light themselves on fire, right? Self-immolation, it's an act of protest. Um, people may think that they're being very strong and disciplined, they're taking the pain. They're not reacting to the pain. I don't think they're feeling any pain. They're with meditation. They've gone into a completely checked out, dissociated state or sort of a, a state outside of the body, and and they're not feeling any pain. Right? That's just something they developed. I, I I think I've told this story before, but it's not my story. I read it somewhere where there was like a mystic, and he was um, in some village or town or whatever way back or something, and and. He was, uh, you know, preaching and it was, of course, it was considered blasphemy by his society. So they were going to, you know, uh, execute this guy. And there was somebody who really admired him, knew what he was saying and kind of, you know, recognized him as like a real mystic, whereas the society didn't. So anyway, as they're walking this guy down the street to be executed, this, this fan of his, this devotee or this follower from above, I guess they were on the street from maybe the second floor, they just threw a rose out and it hit him. And the rose was a nice gesture, right? To say, hey, like, I, I see you, I love you, whatever. And this rose hit him and it brought him back into the body, actually. And so he was actually like upset that somebody threw the rose because he said, wow, you know, you've brought me back into the world. I was checked out and now I have to face, you know, this this." this execution directly, you know? So it seems like it's a skill that some develop on this path. However, it's to be used during certain times. Of course, you don't want to be dissociated when you're trying to relate with, you know, your partner, your family, your kids, you know, when you're trying to take care of your body, you don't want to be checked out. It's something we have access to. The state of consciousness we have access to during times of intensity. And some can, of course, uh, invoke it consciously with practice while others, of course, as, as sometimes as kids, even we learn how to do it. Um, intuitively uh, to keep ourselves safe. So um, there's some, of course, some spiritual ways of looking at it within the lens of meditation and whatnot. Um, therapy can really help because what happens in therapy is the relationship with another human being is so powerful that that relationship almost, if it's cultivated well, it, it demands that you come back in the body to relate with them, with a therapist, right? Um, Self-care for this body says, hey, this body's safe. I can return here. I'm safe. I'm safe. It's okay to be here. Right? We tell our nervous system you're safe. We soothe the nervous system, eat well, exercise, you know, practicing some gentle meditation. But I, if, if we tend to have this sort of uh, sort of airiness to our meditations, a spaciness to our meditations where we kind of get sort of checked out, I, I say engage in meditations like dancing, walking, being in nature, meditations on the feet, right? Like Charlie was sharing earlier, meditating on the feet, just to make sure that the life force, the prana doesn't kind of go all over the place up here. And it's just kind of comes and gets collected in the body. So these are some things that we can also um, consider as well. And also being very gentle with ourselves, knowing like our nervous system, if, if we tend to get checked out sometimes, it's because our nervous system says, I don't feel safe. I don't feel safe here, right? So we have to bring the nervous system up to speed over time by saying, hey, let me give you an update. We're safe now. Like we can be here. Right. And then, of course, cultivating a safe environment, um, which means, you know, boundaries, you know, removing ourselves from any toxic situations, um, developing healthy relationships where we are made to feel safe. Um, we're invited 
to be fully in those relationships, which means we have to be in the body to sense, to feel, right? So just some ideas there, and I'll, I'll just wrap up with a, a reminder as well. You know, this is no medical advice here, you know, not therapy. Um, if you're struggling, you know, there's no harm in, in reaching out to the doctor uh, for some help. And of course, working with a professional um, makes a big, big difference for some. It doesn't have to be only um, within a spiritual context. Yeah. So I hope that can, that can help uh, Chris. I'll, I'll ask you to unmute and maybe if you've got some follow-up. Um, it's a great question. Yeah, no, it is really helpful. And I remember hearing you talk on a podcast about experiencing that as a child as well. And I can't remember it happening as a child, but I've been exploring that as well of just yeah. looking at the history of it and, and really paying attention to the patterns. And then what was helpful today was like, Oh, even this dissociation is like happening within the context of the present moment. And my awareness is still here now experiencing this dissociation. So just <laughs> trying to look at it through that lens of um, helped a lot as well. Incredible. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Deborah shares here. Yes, Chris, I've, I've had similar experiences during various times in my life. Sometimes it's really extreme and I don't feel fully integrated. For me, at first, it was difficult to identify when it was related to trauma. If the awakening lasts and becomes wisdom and joy, I then know it's not trauma, it's expanding consciousness, right? Yeah, Naima is sharing here. I had a teacher in the form of another person recently. I'm going through a relationships healing in phase in life, and this relationship taught me what my true desire in relationships are, to be seen, accepted, and loved for exactly who I am with the least amount of resistance. I desire true intimacy. Wow, that's, that's amazing. To be so concise and clear about what you want. Yuna says, any explanation on why I'm experiencing such fatigue? I've gotten my labs done and they came back fine. I'm pretty sure it has to do with my awakening. The fatigue has become debilitating. Yeah, sorry to hear that. You know, I know um, chronic fatigue is is quite common as people go through this process. Of course, um, you know, can't hurt to visit the doctor. Like you said, you've got your labs done. This is good. Um, you know, I always recommend that we take the most mundane approaches first before you know considering the spiritual angle. Um, this process is very exhausting, right? For the nervous system to be going through so many ups and downs emotionally, energetically, it's very, very exhausting, right? The mind can sometimes race through this process. Sometimes people think spiritual awakening is about having a quiet mind. It could be the opposite sometimes. So all that takes energy. All that takes energy. So it can be very, very exhausting. Our needs can change as well. Our dietary needs, our supplementation needs can change. Um, we can also become very sensitive, right? So we take on emotions, energy from other people, which can be very, very draining as well. These things can happen. Yeah. In the bigger picture, sometimes, I know this has been the case for me, the fatigue would come on and it was basically forcing me into retreat. If I had all the energy while going through this process, I wouldn't have sat to meditate. I would have tried to get away from the process and try to just you know distract myself with some project or business or something. So the fatigue basically forced me to just focus on the process, right? So... In the bigger picture, sometimes this can happen. I've seen other times people, you know, maybe they, you know, get sick or some financial troubles come. Any, it's some it's COVID, for example, like these things were just forced retreat, right? It's context for a forced retreat. Without all of those things, sometimes people would just stay busy, right? Trying to avoid this work. So I'm not saying that's the case for you, Yuna. Just know that, uh, you know, it's not uncommon for the fatigue. I hope you can resolve it. I think there's like, uh, of course, uh, after you've explored what your doctor has to share and whatnot, I think there's some some Facebook groups where people talk about chronic fatigue, some share some different ideas, and you know, more, just it's good to just be in some company, some validation. Lots of Facebook groups around that topic. I think Mahar shares here. I had chronic fatigue, and after labs, my doc recommended I did acupuncture or massage therapy to release the emotional stress from processing my life. Yeah, yeah can help help the process along 
Red Pill Queen shares your same with fatigue in bed 24 hours straight this weekend, then adrenaline and dancing in the kitchen, blasting music a few hours later. All right, ups and downs. Adorable shares here. Hello, all. I'm still going through discovering the benefits of this awakening. I've experienced so many ups and lows, still trying to regulate by doing yoga, meditating, and being in nature. Yeah. Okay, we've got one more great question here. How would you explain kundalini awakening to a doctor? Ah, well, great question. Um, this is probably the, the big question of our century, perhaps. Um, I could barely get my doctor to understand like basic autoimmune stuff. <laughs> like I, I couldn't, I, I don't even know where I would begin to uh, get him to understand uh, about Kundalini awakening, though there are some who, who do um, acknowledge it, some who have lived it. And I'm uh, working on putting together a directory with doctors that do have some experience with this. So kundaliniawareness.org, we do have some doctors um, that uh, know about it. I guess it would beg the question, you know, if you have to explain to them about what it is, what is it that you're hoping for them to do about it? Right? Like, what do you want them to do? Um, the EPRC, Emergent Phenomena Research Consortium, is uh, a big project with this sort of thing in mind. They're trying to raise awareness on a very big scale, particularly within the system, within the medical system, about emergent phenomena. So this is the term that they use that is like an umbrella term that captures, you know, things like near-death experiences, uh, strange experiences that may happen in meditation, kundalini awakening. So the EPRC.org, that's their website. I recently interviewed uh, Dr. Daniel Ingram. He's uh, playing a big role uh, along with the rest of the team in that project. He's a doctor. He was an ER doctor. He's retired now, but uh, of course, uh, lots of Kundalini awakening experience uh, under his belt. Um, so there is some effort being made to raise awareness about this outside of just, you know, the hippie world, <laughs> right? Um, th there's stuff being done and there is some like, you know, peer-reviewed articles and stuff coming out that seem to acknowledge and validate this phenomena. Um, I really think it may be the big question of the next, you know, few decades is all of this emergent phenomena coming to light and being validated by the scientific community, by the medical community. Um, more and more people are having this, more and more doctors. You know, the other day I was talking to a, you know, a doctor, um, a physician with incredibly profound kundalini awakening experience so they're out there many are um you know reluctant to open up about it because of course you know you look like a crazy person um but that's why you know at least we're having conversations here today we're trying to you know normalize it say hey this is a real thing you know we're not crazy people um it's a real thing um so hopefully um you know they will begin to understand more but uh, yeah, I'm not sure how we would necessarily go about explaining it to a doctor without a lot of rapport, a lot of rapport and a lot of trust, you know, but often with our physicians, our family doctors, you know, we see them for like, you know, a few minutes every now and then, and then that's it, they're gone. So there's not a lot of time to build, you know, a lot of trust there to open up about these things. Um, so, you know, yeah. So Dr. Sri Ramshir's here. Reminds me of John Woodruff who had to use a pen name, Arthur Avalon, while writing the classic book, Serpent Power. So he's not ridiculed in his profession. Exactly, exactly, right? So hopefully times will continue to change. We will be more and more validated. I think that's what's happening here. The culture is shifting. More people are having these experiences. The research in psychedelics is becoming more and more legitimized, though there are some, you know, setbacks, it seems. But, um, you know, the psychedelic movement is... You know, picking up a lot of steam, mindfulness movements, picking up a lot of steam. The yoga is, you know, there's a yoga studio on every corner. What do you think yoga is? Yoga is all about awakening kundalini and self-realization, right? So the groundwork is being done. Groundwork 
it's definitely being done. Okay. So thank you all so much for another great conversation. Lots of incredible shares supporting one another. Really appreciate it. We are making a difference, it seems. So thank you all. Thank you all. If you'd like to offer a donation, I appreciate it. It goes a very long way. It allows me to do this work. Thank you. Thank you. I got my course, Grounded, Spiritual Emergence and Integration. So if you're feeling kind of spacey, spaced out, feeling unsafe in your body, looking for ways to uh, you know, engage in self-care in a practical way, specifically for integration and spiritual embodiment, this is the course for you. You can check it out, brandspirit.com slash grounded. Got a few time slots open for one-on-one -on -one meetings. If you'd like to meet, brandspirit.com slash session, sessions. And uh, tomorrow, 2 p.m. Eastern, Kundalini Q&A meeting. Thank you all so much on YouTube as well. Appreciate you all. Much love all. Good night. Get some sleep. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye now.